Hi, everybody, and welcome to Health Matters. This should be a fun show because we brought back Dr. Paul Saltman. Last time he was on, we went on a riff about health and health issues, and this time we've promised that we're going to stay on nutrition issues. And what we're going to talk about is why you should eat healthy, not just to lose weight, but what the other value of eating healthy, probably the much more important one is. Dr. Saltman, welcome. Thank you, Dave. I'm not even going to go over your long list of accomplishments and everything you've done, except to just hold up your book, which is the University of California San Diego Nutrition Book, and point out that having flipped through it just recently, but talking to you, that this is kind of the book that everybody should have a chance to take a look at. I think so, because it, you don't have to have a PhD in biochemistry or an MD to read it. It's for people. It's a people's book, and it tries to get you to understand that all food has redeeming virtue, and the real issue is how do you put those real foods that you enjoy together in a balanced diet, which gives you the amount of calories that you need for ideal body weight, and at the same time gives you all of the nutrients you need for proper growth and development, ability to withstand uh, onslaughts uh, immunologically and so on. Well, I, and I want to just give a little imprimatur here. You are considered one of the greatest teachers that University of California has ever had. And because I'm, I'm flattered, thank <laughs> well, you. Well, you know, I'm telling you that. You know it. You won the I Lifetime don't. Teaching Award, et cetera. And, and so when you say it's, it's written in a way for people to understand, we really mean that. This isn't somebody writing in jargon so that people can't get it. You're a teacher, and you've been doing that your whole life. You know how to communicate and communicate clearly. I try. And furthermore, it's a book that doesn't try to sell you anything. I don't want you to run out and buy my product or my pills or my potions or follow the mystical, magical Saltman diet. I want you to understand about your body. I want you to understand about the food that your body needs. I want you to understand about what you like and put them together in a meaningful fashion. And, and I've never asked you this, but I bet that if you wanted to, you could have made a Saltman diet and made a fortune. Uh, you've asked me, I will now tell you, <laughs> the perfect Saltman reducing diet. And okay. you'll love this because I it want shows. I want to write this down. Yeah, write it down. Can we do an infomercial? So infomercial. Like you pick any five foods that you like, David. Okay, any I've five. Chocolate. One. Cream. Two. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I like hamburgers. Three. Uh, pizza. Four. And I like iced tea. Five. That That's, those are your five foods. Now, okay. I say to you, David, those are the only five foods you can eat for the next 30 days. You can eat all you want of just those five foods anytime you want. Okay? I guarantee you, at the end of the month time, you'll lose 10, 15 pounds. You know why? Because you will become so bored and sick of those foods that you won't eat them anymore. And that's been shown time and time again. Part of the issue with not eating is being bored with the foods you eat. And when you have a very narrow range of foods like that, you don't eat, you lose weight. So any limiting diet wins, works for yes, a short period of time. for a short period of time. But then what happens, you'll go berserk, right? And then you'll eat everything else, and now your metabolism has changed, and you regain all of that weight, and you're back where you were, only worse, because you have rebounded into a higher weight. And, and I promised when we opened the show that we were going to talk about not <laughs> losing weight. No more. No, no, no. no. That's <laughs> but, the but Saltman I mean, diet. I understand, but we were, were going to talk not just about weight loss, but about the real reason why we eat, which is health. Right. And, and most people confuse diet with maintaining a certain weight rather than diet with maintaining a certain health level. Correct. So how do you start? I mean, let's take a baby and say, how are we going to start this baby eating right from day one? You start with the mother before she's pregnant. You get the mother's body healthful in the sense that the mother has adequate nourishment in terms of the amino acids that she needs for protein, that she's got the essential fatty acids she needs and, and choline and, uh, and so on so that she has proper development of the neurological system. You see she has the trace elements. You see that she has enough calcium, right? You see that she is All not overweight. Before All before that egg gets fertilized. And the moment that egg is fertilized in her womb, huh, then that nutrition has to provide the entire nutrients for that developing embryo. One cell, two cells, four cells, and so on. So a baby starts eating before it's born. Absolutely. And the whole notion of all of these defects that we see, for example, the folic acid deficiency leading to neural tube defects, point one, right. that's not enough, or not enough iron, or not enough zinc for proper development. Then you get real serious problems in the development of the child. 
Flip it the other way. What if the mother is self-abusive to herself and she drinks too much? Then you have fetal alcohol syndrome. Why? Because she is abusing that infant in utero with the toxins that she's taking into her own body or drugs or so on. But the point I want to make is nutrition begins with the pregnant mother and then continues postpartum following birth, either in terms of the nourishment of the child at the mother's breast, which is probably the best way to nourish an infant if the mother can handle it psychologically and physiologically and so on, and or providing the infant with the kind of nourishment that child needs and formula to provide all of those essential nutrients for the growth and development of that child. Well, you've just mentioned something that I think the pendulum swung quite a bit. I remember my parents telling me that when I was born, only poor people breastfed, and the, the wealthier people used bottles because it was a status symbol that you could buy this formula. And I think that nowadays we've shifted quite a bit on that, and, and now we worry about providing bad formulas to third world countries and dissuading people from breastfeeding. So, I mean, we're, we're still at the point where na nature is doing okay? Well, you know, the pediatricians and their nutritional boards continuously reinforce the notion that if we can, if a mother can, she should nourish her child at the breast in terms of all of the advantages it has with respect to colostrum and protection immunologically in those early weeks of life, right. plus all of the nutrients which are in effect geared from a mother's body to nourish a child, not to nourish a cow or not to nourish a soybean. How, how long? A week, well, a month, a year? Oh, not a, <laughs> Two years, three years? One of the numbers I have seen, David, the reason I haven't looked this up, we, we're just doing this off the top of our head, but I remember a period of time they want them at least to, for six months at the breast. And the problem is the mothers start all filled with enthusiasm and I'm going to nurse my baby and my doctor said, and all too soon the realities of their lives set in or the fact that they don't want to get up all the time and they want their husband to get up and, and feed the bottle and so on. And that quickly diminishes. So the three to four months tends to be what women are doing and it's not quite long enough mm -hmm. as viewed by the pediatrician. I, I'm not one to tell a woman to breastfeed. First place, I'm not her pediatrician. In the second place, uh, as, a, as a father, when we had infants, I, my wife did breastfeed for quite a while but I know it was important for me to get up and fix the bottle and hold the baby and, and both of them and, and nourish them in that sense. But the other thing too is that a woman has to feel comfortable about breastfeeding. Many women that I have interviewed and talked with tell me about their anxieties. I'm not giving enough. My breasts are too small. My milk is not enough. Even though if you weigh the baby, how do you know a baby's getting enough? You put it on a heavier. scale. <laughs> if they get heavier, you measure the length and so on. If a baby fails to thrive, then you worry. And that's what pediatricians try to do. But once again, you were talking about the economics, only the poor feed. Now, of course, fashionable to do otherwise. And as you point out, they're pushing formula in places they shouldn't. Because one of the aspects of breastfeeding in the underdeveloped nations, it's a, it's a natural birth control device. That is, a woman doesn't get pregnant as she's nursing. And so, therefore, that's very important in terms of regulation of population. Of population. So now our baby is past the age where they're using a formula. <laughs> right. How, how do we expose a child to foods to develop habits that will s survive into adulthood to give a healthy, happy... Yes. That, the, the answer is one food at a time, curiously enough. And I say that because there is eno enough literature now about food allergies. Kids do get allergic to food. In fact, some children are allergic to cow's milk, some children are allergic to many kinds of food, and so you have to move them. If, you know, even say a child who has got a genetic deficiency, for example, uh, cannot break, is, uh, has lactase insufficiency, mother's milk is deadly. Right. Okay, so what do you do? You've got to move that kid quickly to soy milk. We can do that. Pediatricians do that. Absolutely. They're careful about that. Now, similar things take place as you, as you start moving a child into solid foods. 
the best advice that I, I, I've read, I, again, I wish I were more knowledgeable about practicing, be I should have been a real doctor, my <laughs> grandmother is still <laughs> regretting that. Anyhow, the fact of the matter is you start bringing foods in one at a time to see if the child likes the food, enjoys the food, and then gets the diversity of food that they need. And as you do that, there are enough wonderful foods on the market today, mostly of a cereal form in which are fortified and enriched with those other nutrients that we now know are so important for the child. Whether it's taurine, which is a rare amino acid, which has now been found good for infants and so on, or the cholines and so on, or the irons and the trace elements and, and the vitamins, then you start bringing that diversity in and the child begins to see lots of different foods that are fun to eat and are nourishing. That's the key. Got to be fun, got to be nourishing. Both. Both. Now, we've got a child who's been exposed to these different mm -hmm. foods one at a time, has an armamentarium of food they like, and then they start hitting the huge growth spurts that take place in both childhood and then even into adolescence. Oh, yes. And, and as the hormones change in their body, tastes change and desires change and uh, skin things go on with acne and all. Well, how, do we, how do we teach a child, take them a after babyhood, after toddlerhood, now they're kids eating, how do we get them from there so that they wake up one day and they're an adult and they, they have persisted with the good eating habits that we've started now? Well, for the most, I wish that we did have good habits to, to show our kids. And let me go back to earlier times. You know, the whole notion, I remember growing up in a home and very deeply concerned with good food and good nutrition, all that stuff. And the notion of you gotta eat everything that's on your plate, for example. Uh, because there are children that? starving in Europe, and if in I didn't Europe, eat it, Armenia, somehow Armenia, China, right, whatever exactly. it was. So, and oh, by the way, habits like, if you don't eat all of the vegetables, you don't get the chocolate cake. You get a whole series of... I've heard my mother say that to my son. Correct. And it's the same words that I heard. Correct. And all of that is not good. That is not good because you start building up habits about styles of eating predicated on rewards of good food, the dessert, bad foods that I have to eat, the vegetables, or whatever it is. So we should say, unless you eat all of your chocolate, you don't get your vegetables? Well, there's the Saltman theory about that, <laughs> which says if, if, you got, if you serve the dessert first and you got a kid who's eating too much, maybe that'll quench the hunger from the fatty dessert that the kid is eating, and then he won't go on and eat the rest of the food. Now, that also has been shown to be the case. Huh. I don't advocate that because I haven't got the courage to do I didn't do it with my children or grandchildren. But the one thing I must say, David, you don't make food a punishment. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I sat at that table until I finished my meal. I, right. I, I lived and through all, that. And, and I think that in, in the sense of growing up my kids and seeing how my the notion is you present children the foods that are good for them and you explain why those foods are good and you hope they will enjoy them. And if you don't like broccoli when you're a four-year-old, you may like it when you're a teenager or an adult. I, was, I hated asparagus as a child. I think it's really a remarkably wonderful phallic-looking food. I love it <laughs> a lot. I'll eat it at the slightest provocation. Now, so your taste may change with time. Taste change. Now, one of the things that you, we didn't talk about, very important in terms of food styles, and that's your peer group. Who, who, you're not always eating with mom and dad. One of the big problems in America today, and the surveys show this time and time again, kids are not sitting down with their families at breakfast and at dinner and having a family meal. The socialization, the socialization that comes with food. It's not just food not just food, but so many other aspects of it, and the notion that the parents set the pattern of good behavior. Now, if the parents were having such good behavior, how come we have 30% problems in America with obesity and other food issues? So what we have to do is have not just education for the kid, but education for the parent, and most important of all, setting examples in a family about preparing and enjoying and eating food as a sense of family. And as a realization of the joys of food and the importance of food as nutrient. That's why we wrote this book in a sense, so that you, can, you can't just say, as you hear all the time, oh, I don't have to drink milk. 
I can eat dark green leafy vegetables. And okay. I can. Right. And boom, you go, oh, really? How much? And the answer is four and a half pounds of broccoli a day. <laughs> that doesn't have any meaning. Right. No meaning. It but doesn't replace it. But if you're not drinking milk, where are you going to get it? Okay. So then you begin to talk to children in terms of why your body needs the calcium. Why does your body need a protein? Is there a difference between a protein that you get in a plant and a protein you get in a piece of meat? Is there a difference where the vitamins are and so on? Education. Education. Now, I, I'll tell you something that may please you. This morning, when I was telling my wife about the shows and I said we were going to talk about nutrition, my four-year-old picks his head up and says, Daddy, we're studying nutrition in school this week Beautiful. at four. Beautiful. So I'm hoping that maybe the but tide is turning. Learning? I have no idea. Because he won't tell me. But I, I have to talk to his teacher about it. But, but at least there's an attempt to do that. And there are health classes that take place. Maybe they should have your book in those classes yeah. uh, to, to educate people. But the, the population in the United States has been attempted to be educated with something fun called the food pyramid. Yes. Now, that's supposed to help us figure out which of these foods we need to eat and how much of to eat, and my sense in talking to you now these, these multiple times is that you may be a little uncomfortable with the way that's been designed. D I'm the, terribly food disturbed. Pyramid. I'm you not are. uncomfortable. Okay. I am disturbed. And I'll tell you why. Because too frequently we are looking for simplistic solutions to complex problems. When I was a kid in school and the nutrition lady used to come to our class, there were four basic food groups. Huh? There were fruits and vegetables, there was dairy, there was meat, and there was, in effect, grains and pasta. Four basic food groups. And you recall it was a circle, and it had this wonderful kind of a peace symbol right. in the middle. And, and, the, and the percentage of the areas in the peace symbol were the big part was to be in terms of, uh, uh, of fruits and vegetables and the grains, and then the smaller parts were to be in uh, dairy and meat and poultry and so on. Right? That was very good. And it, why did I like it? Because it was a circle. Everything was uh, came back. To everything each other. was good. It was cohesive. And so now we have a pyramid. Though. Oh, and not only is there a pyramid, but there are good foods and bad foods in the pyramid, right? Right. The bad foods are up on the top of the pyramid. Oh dear, I was uh, playing games where if you were king, you were at the top of the mountain. Okay. Right. But now the good foods are at the bottom of the pyramid, and there are the pastas and the grains and so on. And I go, wait a minute. Are those particularly good foods? Is that all we should eat? Is that all we should eat? Oh no. But then you start going up, and now there's six different groups, and they've arbitrarily divided the fruits from the vegetables. And they've cut down the amount of milk you're supposed to drink and the amount of milk and, and, and meat you're supposed to eat, eat and so on. And then they say, and oh, by the way, fats and sweets and oils are bad for you. Oh, really? I thought sugar was absolutely essential for life. If you don't have 120 grams of sugar, then you can't survive. Oh, Dr. Saltman, you don't understand they cry at me at Washington when I raise hell with them. <laughs> they say, you don't understand. Complex carbos are good. Simple carbos are bad. Complex are good, simple are bad. And what I happens say, to complex in the body? Pardon me, I said, <laughs> my very words. Would you explain to me how many complex carbohydrates you've ever seen in your blood? And the answer is this much, because every one of them has been broken down to glucose or fructose or right. something. And you've taken it in. And the only issue you're going to talk to me about is slow release or fast release of a given sugar. Oh, Dr. Saltman, you don't understand. We don't want the children to just eat sweets. I said, then tell them. What don't they, don't <laughs> not eat, to eat sweets. Just eat sweets. And you also pointed something else to me about the food pyramid, and that was the lack of what we water. have in our cups, which is water. It's there, nowhere to there be was found. The, uh, but the new ones have. Oh, they do. They okay, listen they to me. They listen to me in Washington. They may still not have enough calcium in the pyramid, but at least they recognize that you have to have water. You ha and then they say, I say to them, how about fruit juice? Well. 10% fruit juice like you yeah. find in the stores? <laughs> yeah. No, then, or then I say, and then I say, will you accept Coca-Cola? <gasps> 
and you hear this terrible gasp, you know, as if that the water in Coca-Cola isn't the same water as in Evian bottled water, huh? And I said, what are you doing to me? And of course, that's the irrationality of it all. It comes back to this notion of good foods, bad foods, rather than talking about what are the nutrients in foods and what are the redeeming virtues of the foods in a supermarket. A young man came into me in my office today. True story. He says, Paul, he said, is every food in a supermarket safe? I said, I would not turn down a given food that's sold in a supermarket in San Diego today for fear that it was toxic. I said that the real problem is not its toxicity, but its cheapness, its availability, and its deliciousness. And so the issue is overdosing on the food that's there. And what you have to do is know what the nutrients are in given food so you put them together properly. Now, up to this point, we've totally ignored the notion of, well, how about foods like fortified cereals? See, we talked about it for infants, didn't we? We said right. that's good news. I even say it's good news to fortify the cereals that we get in our breakfast food packages today. And to read the labels is very important because it tells you what nutrients are there. But to not to see that, but not to see that a fortified cereal is the equivalent of a well-balanced diet. It's not a well-balanced diet. It may even be good for a meal with fruit and milk. Aren't and, there uh, people that substitute a vitamin pill in the morning and they think they've had a well-balanced diet? Yes, and that's <laughs> wrong. Okay, it may it may be. For example, you could live a life, David. No, I couldn't because I'm the breakfast chef and I love to cook wonderful breakfast. But you could live a life where the morning was a cup of coffee and a vitamin pill or something, and uh, that gave you your vitamins that you needed huh, for this four to seven day period of a diet. And then uh, that's your daily allotment of that, and then for lunch you do something else, and you can change, you know, you could eat uh, sequentially in some way that you like. And if you still integrate the nutrients that you need over a four it to still seven, works. it's wonderful. So. In order to get people's attention, and, and I really want to grab their attention today, even though we talk that we're talking about eating healthy, we got to talk about eating to maintain weight because that it's like when we talk to adolescents about cigarettes, you can't talk about lung cancer, you have to talk about your breath will smell bad. So we have to get people's attention. If I, I mean, we know that obesity is a huge problem in the United States. Help me understand the way that people can eat to look the way they want. Because if we get them to eat healthy and they look the way they want, we might just give them the health benefits too. I want to disagree with you. Please. And I never argue with my doctors. <laughs> <laughs> I do whatever they tell me. <laughs> okay. Here's the issue. You talk about the issue of looking good. Beauty in the eye of the beholder. If you look at problems, if, or if you look at the issues of the overweight or the underweight, most of those people believe that they look terrific. And I have been out in the field and surveyed them for that. Okay. You hear what I'm saying? Yes, I in do. In their mind's eye, they're beautiful. But when I look at them with respect to the body mass index charts, I know they are at health risk for their weight, for their height. That's the key. So for the, the obese population, the key is getting them so that they're healthy. To bring down that body mass index so that it falls in the range between 20 and 25. How does someone calculate their body mass index? Well, it's, it's easy to say and hard to do. The body mass index is your weight divided by your height, your weight in kilos divided by your height in meters squared. It's in, a, it's in my book. You've got to look it up at the charts. So are you there. convert to meters and you convert, and convert to, to kilos. kilos and you divide and you get a number. And it's not too far away from the metropolitan life tables. And, and in point of fact, what, what those numbers are are very interesting numbers because they're statistical numbers. They say to you, if you are in the right range, you're not too thin and not, not too, too heavy, your chances of health are enhanced in the following sense. Your risk of cardiac disease, your risk of stroke, your risk of, 
kidney disease, hypertension, your risk of late onset diabetes, your risk of gallbladder disease, all of these risks. These are big things. They're, they're the biggest killers in right. an adult population. What about cancer? Cancer of, yes, thank you, cancer of the colon, cancer of the breast, cancer of the prostate correlate with obesity in respectively females and males. All right? So this is, this is good reason. Right. It's good reason to be prudent, plus all of the other aspects of the aesthetics of it as we began the conversation. Now here is the key. What about little kids? You started with kids. I want to come back to kids because the issue of obesity in children is an increasingly big problem. It was I was just at a meeting where they presented data in Australia and they summarized Australian children are getting fatter just like the United States. Food is cheap, it's plentiful. We advertise it everywhere. Huh? Look at a Carl's Jr. ad on television. I mean, you look at the ad and you get heavy watching the <laughs> ad. <laughs> I feel it right on my head. You hips. feel That's it right, right there. It's exactly. But that, the problem isn't that the kids are going to get coronary disease. The kids get obese. And they set eating habits in childhood and adolescence which follow them through adulthood, and then they are at risk. You see, that is the key. The, it's, the notion is you educate children and you make feeding and, 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 and exercise and, and the joys of food, all part of a life, huh? And that hopefully will continue later as they grow up and then they assume that responsibility for themselves. Parenting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, here we started talking about nutrition and, and you and I end up discussing education, parenting, lifestyle, and, and, and in terms of our core discussion of nutrition. It's Correct. kind of amazing. What, but that's what it's all about, David. It's and, what and, it's and all you know, it's funny because it goes back to our, the first conversation we started to talk and we ended up with res responsibility, personal responsibility. And this ties all right back together. Yeah, I hate to you know, beat old uh, you know, <laughs> drums or something. <laughs> but, but again, I, I always want to predicate it on the notion of having the knowledge. You see, I don't want you to eat the Saltman diet. I don't want you to, if you want a vegetarian diet, you should have a vegetarian diet, but you should understand the consequences of that. If you want to eat kosher, you should eat kosher. You should understand the consequences Education. of that. C Paul, can we get you back again? I'm because yours, baby. Every oh. time we sit down to talk, the time flies faster than I know what to do don't with myself. Tell me we're out of time. We just started. We when just, I know, we just started. <laughs> <laughs> we just started, and a half hour is over. But, but will you come back? Whenever you call, David, it's my pleasure to be Thanks. with you. Thanks. I'm Dr. David Granite. We've been talking on Health Matters with Dr. Paul Saltman about what we just said. I mean, really, it's, it's education and knowledge. The more you know, the better you can take care of yourself, the better you can educate your children. This is really taking control of your own life. Instead of lamenting at the end of your life, woe is me, why didn't I take control of it now and do something about it? I'm Dr. David Granite. We look forward to seeing you again. Because remember, your health matters.